This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, and we are Navigating the Journey. Navigating the Journey is dedicated to exploring options and choices in life. Today, we will journey down many different paths. Our guest, Hawaii State Senator Will Espero, has championed more paths than I can count. However, today we will begin with the completion of the State Legislature Special Session. With September 15 deadline to submit the financial plan to the federal government, lawmakers were really busy scurrying around to get that done. So I'm going to ask the senator, what does that mean to us? What is the impact on the neighbor islands? And will we complete this thing or not? OK, Senator Sparrow is a dear friend. He's been in the legislature, what, 19, 20 years? 18. 18. 18. Senator Sparrow was, he worked for the city and county. Mm -hmm. He worked, he was a representative and a senator. And now he's going to run off and give up his seat to run for lieutenant governor. Yeah. Is that correct? That is correct, Marcia. Let's go back. Okay. Let's go back. Now, uh, first, let's complete the special session. What happened? Well, as you mentioned, um, we did have a September 15 deadline from the federal government, and that if we didn't have a financial plan in place, that they would begin the process of possibly um, terminating our $1.3 or $4 billion deal, where we have already received $800 million from the federal government, and we're hoping to get an additional $600 million plus. So, at the end of this session in 2017, uh, there was a stalemate. Uh, the Senate wanted to extend the general excise tax, and the House had come up with a plan for the TAT and the general excise tax. The and TAT The TAT is being the hotel tax, the transient okay. accommodations tax. And because that was offered at the very, very last minute, we really didn't have time to vet it and discuss it. So the rail bill essentially died. Uh, many people thought that it would pass, but it died. Thus, the issue of a special session and the mayor advocating and lobbying, saying we need a financial uh, plan that we could provide to the federal government. Uh, what was on the table, what was agreed upon, was it was a compromise bill. We will extend the general excise tax uh, an additional three years to, right now, it's 2027, it'll be to 2030. The general excise tax is only for Oahu. Oahu, correct. Okay. Okay. And this is what we're paying now, and frankly, most people don't even know that oh, they're yes. paying this half percent. Uh, the new twist is the transient accommodation tax, and that will be increased to 1% for 13 years, also to 2030. But that transient accommodation tax, and that's statewide, which means it includes the neighbor islands, that um, we will be able to get more money up front. So almost like a mortgage, you have more money up front, you put more money down, and then you have less interest over the long run. And, and we're supposed to, with this plan, um, save hundreds of millions of dollars in interest. The opposition to this came from the hotel industry. Of course. And uh, the neighbor island. Mm -hmm. um, but we, we need to make it clear, it's the neighbor island visitor. So it's possible that local people will get taxed if they stay in these units, especially the high price ones. But I don't know how many of our local <laughs> residents are going to be stay, staying in so $400, $500 rooms. Yeah, it's only for the visitor, it's not for the local people. Well, no. It's in, on the neighbor island. It's for whoever stays, stays on the, the neighbor island, island hotels. Okay. And if a local person does, then they have to pay it. Um, however... How much uh, is that 1%? Oh, we're, we're talking um, like for uh, an additional, um, for a room for two, maybe an additional $2. Oh, okay. A, a room. Yeah, so, you know, and if there's 
two people in it or three people in it, then it, per person it even goes down. Um, the majority of the people that will be paying this will be visitors. And it's not as if we're taxing income tax or a corporate tax. And the hotel industry, you know, they're concerned that it will impact uh, the tourism industry. But from what we've been able to see over the years in the past that, you know, with the tax increases, uh, people want to come to Hawaii because this is because it is paradise, Hawaii. right? It is for many of them, it's a once in a lifetime, and you save for those once in a lifetime type of uh, vacations. And for many who come and continue to come, they do so because they love Hawaii, and this is a beautiful place to visit. So, at the end of the day, you know, we compromised. Both sides wanted something different. We were able to come up with a solution, and now. We have enough funding for all intent and purposes to get to Ala Moana Shopping Center. Okay. Now, down the road, if there's talk of extending the rail to UH Manoa or even into Kapolei and Kapolei City, then the legislature and or and the city council will have to vet that and discuss it. So it's possible that uh, we might take another bite at the apple, but in terms of the current plan, uh, Hopefully, the rail will be completed by 2024, 20, 25, from Kapolei to the Croc Center to Ala Moana Shopping Center. Okay, good. I guess that's good. <laughs> if you support rail, yes. Um, and there's going to be many opportunities. I have so many questions about the rail, but let's let's don't. That could be another segment. That's a whole another yes. segment, yes. or two or three. Yes, they've been talking about that for years, so we can't. But at least we can meet the the September 15 deadline. Yes. Okay. Next, let's talk about you. Now, I have known you since you worked for the city and county. And I have watched you champion so, so many bills and projects and what have you. And now you're talking about leaving the Senate. For anybody that doesn't know, if you run for an office, a local office, you have to give up the one you have. Yeah. If you run for a federal office, you do not. Correct. And that's called the Fosse Bill, if you remember. Correct. Right. <laughs> I'm, uh, and I'm in midterm. The key is I'm in midterm. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so you would have to give up being a senator to run for lieutenant governor. And that's correct. And that's what you want to do. Yes. No, I have a thought long and hard about this. And I'm at the, <coughs> excuse me, at the stage in my career where uh, I need to determine and decide what I want to do for the next 10 to 15 years. And I feel that I've had a successful legislative career. Um, people have asked me, do you really want to run because you've done so well and we, we like you there? But I look at it from the perspective that I need to be able to give back more. And I feel that uh, as the lieutenant governor, as the number two person, I could give back more. If, if you like what I'm doing now as a state senator, Marsha, imagine what I can do as the number two person in state government. Well, well, well that's exactly, that was my next question. Usually the well, since Ben Cayetano was the last lieutenant governor that was really active. So, what, that's a nothing job. So, tell me how you feel you can, what can you do as lieutenant governor that makes it a real job and Actually, not just somebody filling up space? That's a very good question. And what I, what I tell people, it's not the position, the title, state rep, state senator, lieutenant governor. It's the person. So if you know my style and my personality and how I have been in the legislature, I will continue that. I will be vocal. I will be an advocate. I will get behind issues and causes. Now, being a partner of the governor, I will not step on his toes. I will not embarrass him or her. And uh, what I want to do is find the issues that need work because there are 
hundreds of issues oh, out there that need yeah. help. And I can see myself continuing, for example, um, law enforcement reform and changes, prison reform, prisoner rehabilitation, um, building an aerospace industry, expanding the medical marijuana program, uh, building a hemp industry, um, working on uh, job creation with science, technology, engineering, math, math. So uh, I would tell the governor that let me know what you want me to do as your second in command. However, if there are not too many things, I have a list and I will work on them because that is what I do as a lawmaker. And you have to understand, the lieutenant governor is um, in the primary elected separately, separately from the yes. governor. So I am still an elected official by the people of Hawaii. And if I'm privileged enough to be lieutenant governor, it's because the voters want me to continue what I'm doing and appreciate it. Okay, you, g you gave us a long <laughs> list here. Yes. Uh, but the thing that comes up right away is the hemp industry. Yes. Knowing what I know about hemp, that is such what it can be. Yes. It's what it can be as an industry. For instance, if we just planted it at Barbara's Point, it would clean up. <laughs> it would clean up the pollution. Soil so, remediation. Yes. 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 So, what's the holdup? Why can't we get behind this and and really make it into something? Why can't we have treeless paper? What, what what's the holdup? Actually, um, we're, we've made significant progress um, due to the federal government passing Congress the Farm Act. And in the Farm Act, states will be allowed to um, create a hemp industry, um, you know, research and development. But part of the Farm Act includes marketing. And I had a conversation with the Department of Agriculture staff, and that marketing entails a farmer, a company, being able to grow hemp and create a product, product and sell the product. What this means is this can all happen in Hawaii by 2018. That's six months. Exactly. It, it, this is very exciting news. It is and exciting. I don't know if too many people know this. This is... But this the, is the, the, what I'm getting at is that there was an article in today's Civil Beat about the emergency of agriculture, the, the, the need, especially when you look at the storms around the world and you think, we need to take care of ourselves. Well, so this, we need all kind of agriculture industry. Right, and the problem at the federal level is cannabis. Cannabis is still a Schedule I, and, okay. and that's the issue. That's the issue. That it, since cannabis is still Schedule I, Hemp is part of cannabis. Yes. Well, let me say yeah. to our audience, the plant, the cannabis plant, or the hemp plant, has at one level is cannabis, at another, as it moves up, it's it's hemp, it's cannabis, and hashish. Right. And so they come from different parts of the plant, different chemicals are in different parts right. of the plant. So, but the hemp, does not have the same thing as the cannabis that makes you high. Exactly. So, hemp so has, this is so different. Hemp has low THC. Right. So you've got, I, I'm, I'm sorry, um, uh, no. you, have, you have the CBD BD, and yeah. the THC. Mm -hmm. The THC is what gets a person high. Ah. Hemp has very low THC, and in some cases it's non-existent, and you can't get high from hemp. That's why... Um, hemp is grown throughout the world. Um, you could buy hemp products in, in yeah. the United States, but you can't grow it. And, and that's where, with the new Farm Act, this is all going to change, and Hawaii is poised for 2018. Okay, we have to go to break, and when we come back, we will talk more about some of the other projects that our new lieutenant governor... <laughs> <laughs> I've already ordained you as the new lieutenant Thank governor. Thank you. We'll be right back. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. 
Some say scuba divers are the poor man's astronaut. At Dive Heart, we believe that to be true. We say forget the moon. Dive Heart can help children, adults, and veterans of all abilities escape gravity right here on Earth. Search DiveHeart.org and imagine the possibilities in your life. Today we are visiting with my dear friend, Senator Will Sparrow, and we were talking about, of all things, hemp. But that's the biggest conversation in Hawaii, is hemp and medical marijuana. Yes. So yesterday uh, we saw a proposal of how to purchase medical marijuana from the dispensary using your smartphone. Now, because medical marijuana, all marijuana, is a Schedule I narcotic, I guess that's what they call it, which it isn't, it's a weed, but that's a different story. So it is a cash business. Yes. None of the banks, because the banks are controlled by the federal government, can take money from the dispensaries, the labs, the da da da. Correct. And because it's a cash business, it's also, well, I know the one dispensary that we visited, they have a security person to walk with you to your car so that no one, and then they have a ATM machine so you don't have to carry cash with you. So there's all of these securities. So now they're talking about a, a, an app for your smartphone. Yes. Uh uh, the EGA administration, working with a credit union out of Colorado, um, is looking at uh, a cashless transactions at these dispensaries mm -hmm. for fear that you know people might try to steal or, or, or rob these dispensaries. Um, and it would do basically an app or debit card type of a situation. Now, I'm I, personally, I'm not sure yet. On, on my opinion on that, whether it's good or bad, because uh, I know many people would probably still want to go in there with cash. And there's no other place that I'm aware of, and maybe you could help, that we tell a business or a company that you can't accept cash. <laughs> well, I think they have to still accept the cash. No, they're looking at no cash at because all. Because there are a lot of people that don't have smartphones. I have a dear, dear friend that she has a smartphone, but she doesn't know how to use it. Un so. Understood, but to, to deal with that, what will happen is the dispensaries will work with the individuals at the dispensary. So you would still have to log into an app, but the dispensary would do that for you, and you could use the dispensary's um, tablet or computer for the transaction. That's what would happen, because you have to be present in order to do the transaction. So, well, okay, now I have a debit card from the bank, but I have to put money in the bank first yes. before I can use my debit card. Yes. So how do you deposit money into that Colorado Credit Union? Well, I haven't seen the system yet, but I'm assuming that through the app, um, you'll be able to do all that. So a uh, patient or caregiver of the patient would have to have access to an individual app that you um, are logged into. And, and that's really the, the crux of it all, that you must be online in order to do this transaction. And n my understanding, no cash at all. So I'm still, okay, but I have to have money somewhere for the app to take the money out of my account. Some place, right. I have to have some money. Right, and like I said, I'm sure the app, once you get into your app, 
then would you'll it take be, it from my local bank? Yes, that, that's my guess, that somehow everything will be connected because this is the system that is already being used on the mainland. And, oh, okay. Right? It's so they worked that out. Yeah, it's yeah. not a new system. Um, but I don't think in the mainland it, it's mandatory, uh, it's an option. We may be the first state to make it mandatory that every dispenser must use this app system. Well, my, my question then becomes, if I am the owner of the business, the, the dispensary, then, but I have to pay Hawaii state tax, and that's not with an app. <laughs> they want a check or what have you. Um, that's another issue then. Yes, but um, they have to pay the state tax. So how do they pay that if all of their money goes? I mean, is this? Well, I'm assuming that's built into the system. That will be built into the system. Mm -hmm. And because uh, I'm sure the state wouldn't go for this if they couldn't see that they were going to get paid. Correct. Right. So you have to figure that at this stage, all the the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed, and this system has been reviewed and analyzed. They've checked with the other states. And our um, state has determined this will work for Hawaii. Okay. Now, we, real quick, tell us, run through some of these other projects you have. You talked about prison reform, housing, low-cost housing. Yeah. I office. mean, the, the, uh, in terms of prison reform, uh, the big issue next session is going to be what are we going to do with OCCC. Uh, this is the jail in Kalihi, and um, there's talk of moving it to another location and or um, rebuilding it um, more modern, more efficient, because it's a very old, dilapidated facility, yes. and we need to do something with it. If we move it, it, it could cost us 600 to $700 million to replace it. Um, I'm of the opinion, though, whatever we do, one part of the equation has to be rehabilitation and a, a re-entry center, because Every inmate, or at least 96, 98 percent of the inmates, are going to be released one of these days. So do you want an inmate who has had programming and rehabilitation or one who hasn't? The answer is obvious. We want an inmate that has been rehabilitated or has gotten um, some yes. help. And that's why one of the issues I'm pushing for is the re Re-entry Re Center. That's, that's great. I like that. Uh, next, about housing, because we have so many homeless people, and so many of them are working, but they can't pay $1,800 a month rent. Well, there's, there's so, many things going on in the housing field, um, but uh, one of the big issues is to just build more housing. Uh, our need back of, to him. Our, uh, yes, <laughs> and, and as a matter of fact, I believe there is a home in Maui that is built out of hemp. Mm -hmm. So hemp could be a building but, material, absolutely. Uh, but uh, it's going to take us probably seven or ten years to to build enough housing because our need on Oahu is 22,000. Uh, one area I want to Today. push to no for the next ten years, 22,000 units. But uh, I've been pushing and others for a safe zone. Uh, basically, this is just a legal place where the homeless can go because what's happening is all we're doing is pushing them from one oh, area yeah. to another. Uh, the city council passes a sit, no sit and lie zone. So when you say, okay, no sitting and lying in this area, what do they do? They just go to the next, next community. Yes. And we're just pushing them around. As a matter of fact, you remember Kaka'ako Park in that area? It yes. used to be a ghetto and a shanty town, and we cleaned it up. The homeless are back in Kaka'ako Park because they have nowhere to go. So Mayor Kim on the Big Island recently opened the first government sanctioned safe zone wow. and it appears to be working. I had a conversation with him about a week ago and he said um, right now it, it started with 32. He's looking to expand that island-wide on the Big Island to maybe up to 500 homeless. I'd like to see the state and Arsene County also create a safe zone somewhere. Sand Island would be an ideal location where I think we could use up to 20% of the park and easily house a thousand homeless. And then at this safe zone, you give them the resources, the assistance, the help, 
that they need for transition. So basically, a safe zone, all it is, is just another way of saying a transitional housing area. Now, does that have to go through the legislature? It, what, what would it take to get that started? It would have to go through the legislature and or, or the city council. And there's been attempts, but it hasn't been successful. Last year, we did pass a bill uh, that is mandating that um, there will be a working group to look into the safe zone issue. So that's a good start. And hopefully, I actually need to check to see if this working group is up and running because uh, we, we do need to have it up and running. Yes. yes. Not, not just on paper, but real people doing something. Right. Yes. And hopefully, they can have a recommendation by 2018. And then we still need to um, put money into our infrastructure because along the rail line, there's state land. Um, UH West Oahu, Mayor Wright, Evale Housing, the stadium, Honolulu Community College, and Leeward Community College. We are the biggest landowner along the and rail line. And there's some public schools along there. Yes. But what we need to do is to invest money in infrastructure in the sewers, in the sidewalks, so that there's capacity to build high-density communities, um, transit-oriented development. And that's part of the equation as well. OK, we have one minute to go. What else you got? Real quick. Well, I think um, the final one is the aerospace industry. I've been working on this for many years. By next year, Hawaii could have a federal spaceport license and this will be the beginning of space tourism, where um, out of the Kona Airport, people will be able to fly into lower Earth orbit, uh, go into basically outer space, and come back down. It will be a niche market for tourism. Wow. Yes. <laughs> Next year, huh? Next year, we expect On it. On Kona. Have, Kona. It was to get the license. To and get the, the license. And then the companies need to come in and... And bid on it. And, 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 do, and build it. Exactly, exactly. So Wonderful. That's probably two, three, four years out. Okay. So now you promise me you will come back because that's a lot. So we need to talk about all There's of that. There's many more things we could talk about. And I appreciate the opportunity, Marsha. Please, please do come back. Thank you all so much for being with us. As a pleasure with the Senator. And we look forward to visiting with you again. Aloha.